I would like to welcome all the guests and visitors of BRAFA. And I'm very pleased to see my compatriots in this room. And I hope that in the course of this hour you will, first of all, learn something new and uh, will genuinely enjoy your time because my story, my lecture, bears a romantic tinge to it. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of BRAFA for the invitation to present and to, uh, this talk and to participate in this fair. For the first time here in Belgium at this old fair, the representatives of Russian museums are participating and I will even say that I'm the representative of one of the greatest museums of Russia, the Tretikov Gallery. Everybody knows the Tretikov Gallery, any Russian knows. And whenever you mention the gallery, nobody, no Russian needs another explanation. But uh, unfortunately, our collection that was collected, compiled by Pavel Tretikov is little known outside Russia. And I hope that this talk will fill in the blank space. And uh, I'm about to begin. And first and foremost, I would like to show you the entrance to the gallery. It is an old mansion in the Lavrushinsky side street in Moscow. This is the original place where the Tretikov Gallery collection originated and where the core of the collection is stored, starting from the painters of the 17th to the uh, 18th, 19th century. What was the idea behind the collection? There is always an idea. And uh, it's wonderful when a certain idea becomes the basis for collecting these or that collection. The founder of the gallery, Pavel Tretikov, was a merchant industrialist and a member of an old Moscow, old Mer Moscow merchant family. When he was 23 years old, that was when he decided that he will become an art collector. But he decided that he will collect art not just for his own enjoyment and pleasure, not for commercial interests. He set for himself a more, a broader, a more patriotic goal. When he was 23, he made a will. And in his will, Tretikov said that he wished to collect the works of his contemporaries, of his compatriots, of the Russian painters, so that future generations will be able to share in the wealth of this collection. He wanted to uh, do something to do something that would be useful and enjoyable for everyone not just for himself. And he succeeded in this. Over 30 years of uh, continuous collecting of the Russian painters, of contemporary painters, of Tretikov. And very often Tretikov would actually commission paintings and he would go to painters' um, workshops and actually buy directly from him. He collected uh, over 800 drawings, thousands of paintings, a small but a very decent collection of sculpture and icons. And all these works decorated, uh, were in his, decorated the walls of his house, of his residence. And you can see a rare photograph of the interior of the Tretyakov Gallery in a way as it looked during the last years of Tretyakov's life. The paintings first were hung in his study, uh, with drawing rooms and, and so on. Mr. Tretyakov had a large family, had a wife, four daughters and two sons. And very soon Tretyakov understood that this number of paintings is impossible to accommodate in his residence. So he started a building project. He started adding buildings to his home and by 1902 uh, a very important event took place. Tretyakov bequeathed, gave as a gift 
to Moscow, to the city of Moscow, in the entire collection. He basically gave to the, the Russian people this wonderful and rich gift, the collection of the Tretikov Gallery. And we preserve the memory of this wonderful gift. And this is the idea that unites our collection. This is a, a, a thought, an idea, a collection that shows, represents an entire age in Russian art, sprinkled with wonderful masterpieces, not of only of the 19th century, but also of the 18th century. Mr. Tretikov had an excellent feeling for paintings, for arts. Whatever he collected had a very good quality and value. We have two uh, buildings. Our collection has two buildings. One is in Lavrushinsky Periulok, in the old building which has been renovated many times since uh, Tretikov actually gifted his um, residence. There are 62 halls and this, uh, these halls house the core of the collection, starting from the 17th to the 20th century. We also have a second building in Krimsky Wall Street, which is not very far from Lavrushinsky Street. It's on the embankment. And in, on, and in the second building, we exhibit the 20th century art. And here we have a paradox. If you heard about Chagall and Malevich, perhaps not very many of you, apart from my compatriots, probably heard about Repin, Kramskoy, or about the painters of the uh, painters of the 18th century, Rokotov or Berovikovsky. These are the. This is the period I'm an expert on, uh, and so. It is Russians who know the gallery well, who know the names of those paintings, who visit the gallery regularly. And uh, they grow up knowing, they grow up having a certain attachment to the Tretyagov gallery. So I would say this is a fairly traditional history of a museum, of a foundation of a museum. It's a fairly old museum. We've just celebrated 160th anniversary since the foundation of the gallery. But yet we are a very young museum. We have a lot of young staff and we are developing, we are dynamic, we move forward, including the area of research and examination of art first and foremost of our collection. Any museum specialist operates at complex terminology close to uh, engineering. We all know what binoculars are, irradiation, X-ray imaging, spectrography and so on. These are all methods of examination of the works of art and we use them, develop them, acquire new equipment in order to improve the methods of examination which will help us later to date various works, to discover the information on works and to conserve them. You see a few pictures of my colleagues colleagues at work. You can see that they work in various areas of the Tretyakov Gallery, uh, which are not open to an ordinary visitor. And of course, when people visit the gallery, they know very little or practically nothing about what's going behind the scenes, what's going behind the closed doors with a plate authorized only. And these areas of the museum, the innards of the museum, are very interesting. You can see the museum storage on those pictures. Our storage is one of the best in the world and probably can even compete with some European museum storages. You can see our conservers at work. We have excellent workshops with professionals who do their job at a very high level. They restore and conserve paintings, icons, various objects of applied and decorative art and frames. Of course, frames are very important 
we have an excellent collection and repository of old frames for paintings. Apart from those uh, specifically museum professions, museum jobs, conservative restorers, we have a team of slightly mysterious workers uh, under the general title of a research specialist or historical specialist, art historians. Many of my colleagues, or oh, many of my um, former classmates were asking me, what are you doing every day? What, what is your job? So this is what my job is. I, I work in the li in the library we have an excellent library a very specialized library and one of my uh, responsibilities is actually to work in the archives and our library in order to find out various traces very uh, of uh, traces of histories of various paintings and uh, there is information on uh, the history of works and of course I closely work with my colleagues from the department of research and this uh, department uh, researches and examines the works of art using all the latest technologies you can see the equipment for the take chemical analysis you can also see a very old uh, traditional but very effective uh, equipment and x-ray machine uh, you can see the rotative paintings that have just been x-rayed and also the black square uh, the Malevich's painting black square which has been closely researched and uh, certain discoveries have been made based on these pictures so this is probably one of the most valuable areas of work uh, various, uh, one of the most interesting spaces of museums where we work with uh, paintings, study, research and scrutinize the works of arts. We see things that other people are not able to see and cooperation between museums or rather the museum community is very important because it consists of people who assist each other, who complement the work of each other and use various traditional, old and high-tech methods of examination of the collection. We know things by hand, under our fingertips, if you like. But it is uh, slightly sad that a lot of our work becomes uh, or goes unvisible invisible to an ordinary uh, vi to ordinary visitors and for that purpose uh, we decided to organize an exhibition called secrets of the old paintings perhaps you may think that the title of the exhibition is uh, rather you know simple or mundane but uh, it's it's actually a very uh, it covers a very large um, scope of mystery of work when a painting becomes a part of a museum collection, it acquires a second life and we, it is the museum community, the museum specialists who give the painting this second life, who take care of it, conserve it, who uh, care of a painting as if it's their child and uh, whose job is to study and reveal mysteries of various paintings and works of art. This exhibition was rather unusual. Our audience became experts and uh, investigators when they were visiting this exhibition. People who had no idea what te technical methods we use for examining works were able to see how we x-ray paintings uh, so we would provide a uh, an, an image and a painting side by side and some paintings we even presented with their backs open which is something unprecedented we had special stands decide, uh, designed for that so the people could see the back side and the front and you have no idea what a wealth of information can be found on the back of the painting and which is obviously hidden most of the time. The exhibition was extremely popular, we had an excellent press coverage and it's uh, 
idea, the, the whole premise of the exhibition attracted a lot of attention. We have prepared two editions which were both interesting for professionals and for amateurs, for collectors, for young people, for older generations, for school children, students, perhaps for those who are thinking about becoming uh, a specialist and a museum expert. And therefore, um, it was a very good idea. Unfortunately, you have no access to these editions. And therefore, I would like to offer you to play in this game. This is an online game and it's called Museum Professional. You can you use a link, you access the site and for 30 or 40 minutes you can get a very good idea what it's like to be a museum professional. You can pass through all the departments, you can start from the library, then go to the restoration and conservation department and uh, so on and so forth. But you will be, it's a really interactive game. You would be able to either conserve a certain painting or a frame a painting or guess certain things or discover certain things about certain works of art. Uh, again, I can talk endlessly about the Tretyakov Gallery, but my task today, my job today, is slightly different. I would like to introduce you to two very interesting stories who were the heroes, the subjects of this exhibition. And these two examples, these two stories, given a very good idea of what discoveries and mysteries we uncover in our museum. And it also gives you an idea of what our job looks like. The first topic is about a myth about an artist. And some myths that appear are so beautiful, are so wonderful and familiar to people that nobody wants to think otherwise or look for the truth. And so one of those myths, namely about a romantic painter, I will try to uncover for you, dear audience, and I will try to uncover the mysteries of one of the works of art that is exhibited in our gallery. You see uh, a hall with the representation of paintings of uh, Orest Kiprienski. Uh, this is a this is already a very romantic name to start with. His parents gave him the name of Kiprienski was because his father was unknown. Most likely, he was a natural child of a count, and therefore to conceal the no, the parentage of Arist. He was given the name Kiprinsky, which whose etymology is from Kiprida, that is Aphrodite. Kiprinsky was considered the best portrait painter in Russia. And as it often happens with a painter who is popular in one century, he quite often becomes unknown and forgotten in the following century, and that's what happened to Kiprinsky. Of course, the specialists and art connoisseurs remembered about Kiprinsky, but his works did not receive the attention that was due to him. So he was partly forgotten for the entire 19th century and only at the beginning of the 20th an interest got kindled about this painter. Please, uh, you can see two portraits that have been highlighted for you and I will be talking about these two self-portraits, two paintings. The one which is at the bottom is the most famous self-portrait which was painted in 1827 when the painter was shortly to leave for Italy. He never came back from that trip. At the top you can see uh, the painting which is considered or attributed to Kimprensky and that bears the title self-portrait. Uh, about uh, 
Neither of those portraits have changed their names. They still bear the name self-portrait of Arest Kipriansky. The portrait on the left uh, is usually called the self-portrait in a stripy dressing gown. Uh, the date, the origin and the authorship of this painting remains the same. But not the same can be said about the second self-portrait, which was uh, allegedly painted in 1928. This painting raises a lot of questions and doubts. We argue a lot among ourselves and we suffer when we argue because we would like to know the truth, we would like to answer those questions, to find the, the answer this, the, to, to find the key to the secrets. And the researchers and art historians for many years and even decades were battling, were studying those two self-portraits. My elder colleagues have been working for almost two decades trying to solve the mystery of Kiprinsky. So what did they find out? Indeed, the portrait on the left belongs to Kiprinsky's brush. It is his self-portrait. The authorship has been confirmed and the identity of the, of, of the young man has been confirmed. However, the portrait on the right raises many questions. A lot of doubts have been raised many years ago. My colleagues have come to the conclusion that the image on the left, on the right, I'm sorry, cannot be a true representation of Orest Kiprensky and cannot belong to his brush. How did they come to this conclusion? Fortunately, they were able to rely on X-ray images of those two portraits. Again, they match the same uh, position as on the previous slide. And I'm sure that those of you who are familiar with X-ray imaging may immediately see the difference. Please uh, pay attention to the brushwork of the painter. So, on the left, we assume that this is a true painting by Kiprinsky and therefore bears the characteristics of all his paintings, his technique, his style and so on. The self-portrait in the stripy dressing gown is a, has a very, uh, reveals a very continuous structure. You can see the brushwork, you can see how the painter was laying the layers of paints in a certain sequence, slowly, very carefully. And therefore you can see on the X-ray image that the painting has a certain volume, plasticity, it's like a sculpture. The colors are also very important. You can see how gradually the painter was laying the paint without any rush, with a lot of care. The portrait on the right shows a completely different technical work and brushwork. And the most, uh, let's say, the most important uh, definition we can find is that it has a very sharp contrast play of shadow and light. And also you can see that there was a lot of um, superficial or surface um, brushwork. You can see that the painter wasn't trying to create depth. Everything is on the surface and that is how the, uh, the impression we get from this painting is that it's a very momentous, it's a very quick impression which has been quickly laid down on the canvas. And the difference in this uh, brushwork and this style and technique of execution made my colleagues raise serious doubts about the authorship of the portrait. But if you think that this was the end of the story, you're very much mistaken. 
this romantic story, which goes back decades, allowed us to re-examine these works and to present them at the exhibition. We put them side by side, and you probably noticed that apart from these original works, we've also placed the images, uh, a few other images. Uh, they, they were, these were light boxes with a reproduction of a few portraits, certain portraits of some people. So why did we place those light boxes? I go back to 1911. At the end of the 20th century, the first Kiprinsky exhibition, uh, the first major exhibition of Kiprinsky works were, took place. Uh, as I mentioned, he was forgotten for the entire 19th century. But at the beginning of the 20th century, romanticism and romantic style and ideas and art became fashionable. And Therefore, uh, on this slide you see six portraits which were exhibited at that exhibition of 1911. But in addition to those six, there were another six or possibly 15 portraits and all of those portraits were believed to be Kiprensky self-portraits, every single of them. I think you don't have to be an expert to understand or to notice that all these paintings are very different from one another and these people are very different, not just because of their faces, ages, physiognomy, uh, but even the color of their eyes, their features are different. What is amazing and surprising that the art critics were not, were not um, bothered by this. What was important is a myth about a romantic painter, a painter of the age of romanticism. It was considered that a romantic painter does not necessarily paint his likeness. He tries to lay on the canvas his inner image. And because an artist is an extraordinary person, it's not someone ordinary, he has a deep personality, he is unusual, uh, he is mysterious. That is why, or that explains why the people on the portraits are so different. And that is why the art critics at the beginning of the century were not doubting the authorship because they believed that Kiprinsky depicted his inner mood, his image as he felt at that moment and that that is why it was decided and was believed that Kiprinsky was the author of all those self-portraits. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that all these works were assembled from private collections. The museum did not have any portraits or paintings by Kiprinsky in, their, in its own collection. And therefore we were very excited whenever we would discover Kiprinsky's painting. Evgeny Schwartz was a St. Petersburg collector who has collected or has assembled a decent collection of various works. In his collection he combined the works of the Russian painters of the 18th and the 19th century together with the works of the Western painters of the same age, of the same period. Is, I'd like to draw your attention to the bottom paintings. Those two works are, uh, come from Schwarz's collection. And I'm sure all of you have recognized the portrait on the left, which is Kiprinsky's self-portrait under big question mark. 
So I will be speaking about the self-portrait of the young and the old Kiprensky. These are the titles that the paintings received at that time. The art critics were enthusiastic about those works. They admired the way the painter managed to depict his inner world on those two canvases. In 1916, in the magazine Old Times, we read the article of Sergei Ernst dedicated to Schwarz's collection, and this art critic was considering those two portraits. The artist's two self-portraits, Kiprinsky's portraits, from the collection are probably his most brilliant works in terms of their expressive impact. They reveal most the secret and inconstant world of his artistic imagination. The first portrait depicts the artist as a young man whose genius is in full blossom, just as the glorious reign of Tsar Alexander I begins. Kiprinsky's youthful face is shaped by blazing brush strokes, inspired broad brush strokes against a glimmering silver-green background. He's wearing an artist's smock, his brushes are tucked behind his ear. Now let us consider the second portrait. Out of the deep, dark background, a strange and frightening gaze of an ill and exhausted artist meets our eyes. His elongated face, masterfully sketched with broad stead strokes, resembles the emaciated visages of El Greco. Again he's wearing a smock, his brushes are behind his ears. These two canvases bear the ultimate mark of the beginning and the end of the great artist's career. So, as, 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 as far as the faces, the physiognomic likeness, we see no resemblance. We can see the resemblance in the composition, in the dress of the uh, subjects of the painting. If we consider the light, we see a huge difference uh, in light, the light contrast, the contrast of shade and light, which is very uh, typical of romanticism. But shortly afterwards, both portraits, both self-portraits uh, were divided, were no longer in Schwarz's collection. The old, port the portrait of an old mart master uh, who resembles a Rembrandt's self-portrait uh, uh, went to St. Petersburg. And the portrait on the left was acquired by a collector called Levin. And the Tretikov Gallery later acquired the portrait of the artist as a young man. And therefore, those two works became separated. But a few years later, something happened to the old Kiprinsky. Suddenly, this painting was re-identified and was identified and confirmed as a self-portrait of Christian Zeibold and of an Austrian painter, Gerievich, who was an art critic and the art researcher, did a, a brilliant work of identifying that uh, second portrait of the portrait of an old master. He compared the technique, the, uh, the style of the painting to Zeibold's work and was able to confirm the author and the, the attributed correctly. After that, the painting went to the uh, uh, Russian hermitage. Can you imagine the surprise of the hermitage staff when they suddenly acquired a new work by Zeibold? They actually received this information from me. They in all the documentation which accompanied this painting, it was mentioned that it was Christian Zabel's work. If things became more or less clear with the second portrait, the first remained mysterious. I have to go back to the uh, beginning of the story. 
When in the 70s and 80s my colleague raised their first doubts about the attribution of this portrait, a few X-ray images and certain examination works were made, and my colleague Olga Olenova was writing that an artist, and a romantic artist, cannot simply cannot and will not paint with such brush strokes. It is an age where nothing could remain unfinished. It was important to render the plasticity, the smoothness, the forms, the work had to be finished. And the resemblance between an artist and his model or a painter and himself has to be there. But if all these things are true, then the question is, who is this young man who is depicted on the portrait on the left. Olga Olenova uh, suggested that it may be a portrait of a different painter, of a less known painter, but of a painter, painter nonetheless. It appears that Schwarz, the collector, inherited his paintings from uh, another art collector, a very enlightened person who lived uh, in the 19th century in St. Petersburg. His name was Alexei Tamilov. Tamilov was the center of, um, he had a circle of friends, painters, artists, and those artists, when they would assemble at uh, Alenov's, um, at uh, Tamilov's place, they would draw each other, they would paint each other, or make copies of the masterpieces of the old painters and so on. And therefore that led to the conclusion or to the suggestion that the portrait on the left could be a portrait uh, or could be attributed to Pyotr Zabalotsky. You can see a photograph of uh, the portrait of Pyotr Zabalotsky, who is widely unknown, and his portrait did not survive. This young painter was a guest at Tamilov's estate, and it's quite likely that he could be working and painting there at that time. But what was important for the researcher Alenova is the following. Zabalotsky does not really resemble himself, does not really look like himself on, on this portrait. And the manner of, of painting is also a little bit different. You know, we again go back to the basics. A painter was striving for resemblance, for completeness, for a perfect um, finished work. And therefore, a resemblance, physical resemblance, was important for a romantic painter. If we go back to Zeibold, we can imagine that a young painter, or Kiprinsky, or anyone else, could be looking at those, at, at this painting, at Zeibold's painting, and was inspired to create his own work in the same style and the same um, manner. You can therefore. Uh, Perhaps he borrowed the structure, the uh, arrangement and the makeup of this painting from Zeibold's portrait. But there are certain differences. For example, the, brush, uh, the, the brushes are behind different years on the two paintings and the uh, dress is a bit different. Still. The fact or the myth that we were uh, in the possession of two famous self-portraits by Kiprinsky was crumbling apart and we were very upset about it. It's a paradox, it's a, it's a blow to us. And uh, also the fact that those pictures and paintings were in catalogues, they were published, they were attributed, and all my colleagues, my students were asking the questions, so what is it, what is this mystery, who is this young man who is so free, who is so romantic, has, uh, has no regard for any conventions, but we were still digging for the truth. 
Does it mean that the Tretyakov gallery, instead of Kiprinsky portrait, just uh, has a portrait of an unknown artist and lost its uh, chef d'oeuvre? But that actually wasn't so important. What was important is to establish a link between our audience and the heritage that we inherit from our ancestors. And the beginning of the century was a very important time when the art collection was gaining impetus and when the interest towards the works of the old masters was gaining more and more stimulus. And our staff, our colleagues, practically made the story about the examination and the origin and attribution of this portrait. We went back to the Zabel's portrait. We have discovered that both self-portraits were being restored at the same time. What, what happened to those two paintings uh, was the following. They uh, were realigned. Each painting received a new lining, which is a rather outdated conservation technique, which was nonetheless used in last centuries. So what was the way those paintings were treated was the following. Both self-portraits of the old and the young painters received a new line. Uh, we even have the exact date when this was done, 1902. And uh, a fairly, fairly prominent conserver, Sidorov, performed this operation. And this is not accidental. Kiprinsky was becoming becoming rediscovered at this time and therefore in order to present his works at the forthcoming exhibition these works had to be restored and that's how it happens that the portrait of a young painter and of an old painter were both of, were both found in the conservation at a workshop of one person so this is a story of a myth that was destroyed but at the, at the same time rediscovered, enriched by new facts and new details. It was extremely interesting to trace the links and to study the impression those paintings make on modern audience. And so my second story is also about a paradox in our perception of the works of arts. I'm sure that most of you know this work, are familiar with this painting. I'll be talking about an excellent masterpiece of Vasily Pukirev, which is called Unequal Marriage. The attribution of this work raises no question. This painting is beloved by many people, young and old. And what is important, what is interesting, what touches the people is that we are witnesses to the tragic story of a young girl who is getting married to an old general and that also exposes the vices and old ridiculous morals of the past centuries when young girls were married to old grooms and even now when those realities are no longer relevant this painting touches the hearts of everybody. This painting was created in 1862 and immediately went on display at a Moscow exhibition. The reaction to the painting was extremely wide. There was a lot of noise in the press. Uh, in the press, art critics were debating how wonderful this painting was. Some critics were unhappy with this painting and uh, were saying that he was too critical and uh, about about the modern society and uh, a little bit harsh. But 
the most uh, striking description of this work perhaps belo belongs to a very prominent art critic Vasily Stasov, who was an excellent expert in the 19th century paintings. This is what Stasov was writing about this painting. What subject can be more mundane than the purchase and sale of a bride? Are we not ourselves the daily witnesses to such a transaction? And yet no one before Pukherev had ever depicted such a scene. Everybody was just too busy with Greek heroes, Christian martyrs, as if the intensity of grief and suffering could be felt less if experience yesterday or today instead of two or three thousand years ago, as if it mattered whether one was suffering in a grand palace rather than in an ordinary room wearing a starched skirt. It is important to note that it is quite an unusual way the painter presented this scene. Everything seems to be familiar, and yet the, uh, the impression of presence required a lot of work, right? a great mastership. We are as if present at this. Uh, scene. Pukirev has used a very interesting device. He made the picture quite large and uh, in fact it was the size of a grand portrait, of an official portrait. Usually the paintings of that genre of everyday scenes were expected to be fairly small, you know, where when you can look at the painting and see the entire picture just at one glance, whereas here we, the, the size of the painting is very, very large. Another quote, everything stands out with such intensity, realism and truth in detail that it seems that these clothes, the priest's robe, these hands, the veil, hair, are only a touch away. Under examination, the faces of the old general trying to look cheerful and his tearful bride look so familiar as if one has already seen those faces a great many times. I must say that this painting has a Wide worldwide fame. It's been sent to Paris, and um, by that time, Pukarev has already sold this painting to his friend. And at that moment, Pavel Tretyakov, who was already eyeing this painting and wished to purchase it, he started pursuing the art collector who has bought this painting and made sure the painting was eventually in his collection. He paid an exorbitant sum of 1,500 1, rubles. It was an enormous sum of money at that time. And he did manage to convince the previous owner to sell the painting to Tretyakov. Since that time, the painting has been in our collection. But the reaction to this painting is always very diverse, very uh, contradictory. Some people think that the, the bride is, uh, you know, is a, is a husband hunter, and the, the, the groom is a decent uh, man. But uh, you, you can see the photograph of where this painting was placed a uh, hundred years ago. This photograph was made by Yevgeny Khaldi, a very prominent photographer, and you can see uh, a, a couple, a, a couple which is looking with great love and affection at this painting. You can see already the contra, the contradictory feelings that this painting raises in people controversial feelings. And what is so special about it? It's a very realistic painting. People wish to know, is it, a, is it a story from real life or is it an imaginary scene? And of course, most people think that this is a true story, a depiction of a real tragedy. Inspired by those 
debates, those questions, we decided to dig a little bit into the story of this painting. First of all, we selected this picture for the uh, exhibition, uh, The Mysteries of All Paintings, and we created a video clip. Our clip received an award at uh, prestigious international short film festivals dedicated to museums and uh, we're very proud of this award. So here is a short Как сложилась их жизнь? Неужели она так и была несчастна до конца своих дней? А он? А он, наверное, умер через пару лет. И ей досталось его наследство. Интересно, а кто этот молодой человек? о судьбе ее героев вы сможете на выставке «Тайны старых картин» в инженерном корпусе Третьяковской галереи. Received the place it was due in the hall of the exhibition, surrounded by other works. And indeed, we were able to disclose a little bit the history of this painting to find out whether it depicted real people. On this slide you see both the painting and a sketch which is also in our museum storage, which of course is never exhibited. If you look close, closely, you will be able to see that the young man behind the bride, and who is the best man, differs greatly from the face of the young man um, on the painting. His, the artist's contemporary created a myth uh, as if this young lady was Bukharev's bride and who was given in marriage to a much older man. And even though Bukharev was a very good-looking young man, he didn't have the means to marry. My friend, uh, my colleague, found out that the person who was depicted on the sketch was not Bukere, but his friend Varintsov. He was his classmate. They both studied in the art school, uh, an excellent school that was founded in the 40s and 50s and which became a very important uh, art school and uh, a lot of famous painters graduated from this art school. What uh, helped us to identify the young man as Varintsov is this photograph of a, um, of a lost portrait of uh, Sergei Varintsov. Look, those two young men look very much alike and if you compare their physical features, they practically are identical. Uh, archives also helped us a lot. Indeed, Sergei Varintsov had a, a certain tragic story. He was a son of a merchant and was in love with a, a young lady called Sofia Rybnikov and he was already uh, getting ready to propose to his beloved. But the parents of the young lady did not feel 
feel like giving their daughter to a young and poor artist. And so they got her married to another merchant, Merchant Karzinkin. The lady was uh, happy in marriage, had many children and died happily ever after. And so she wasn't married to an old man, she was married to a man of 35 years old. But Bukirev, in order to make the painting more dramatic, did not want to paint the groom as a 35-year-old man. Um, another event is also worth of noting. Whilst Bukirev was working on this painting, Varintsov fell in love again. He forgot about his uh, fortunate and sad romance and was preparing to get married to another young lady. And when Varintsov found out that he was about to go on a painting, he was enraged, he was deeply offended and demanded that Bukirev removes him from the painting, which the painter uh, duly obliged. So he painted his own self-portrait instead of the portrait of his friend. And in order to demonstrate that fact, I would like to show you the self-portrait of Vasily Pukerev, which is currently in the collection of the Russian Museum St. Petersburg. A similar story concerns other subjects of the painting. In order to make the painting more dramatic, the painter never really copies, never makes an identical copy of what he sees. He uses his impressions, observations. You can see, in fact, the transformation of the groom's image in those three uh, sketches. Uh, Bukhari, from the very beginning, knew that he wanted to paint an old man, a man who is already way past beyond the marriageable age. It is important to note that the Russian Orthodox Church, the Holy Synod, produced a decree which would forbid to marry people older than 60 years old. And you can see that on the painting the groom is much older than 60. Uh, the legend goes that uh, the person who is painted, or the old man who is painted on the left, is actually a portrait of Varintsov's cook. But you can see that Pukarev wasn't happy with his face, and uh, therefore I have included here an unfinished portrait of another old man, the one in the middle. In the middle. It is a study, uh, study which is painted, as we believe, from the Marshal of the Nobility of the city Tver. So it has been painted from a real person. And there is uh, an inscription that this portrait was painted from a certain Prince Tsitsianov. And we can't find any more information about this prince. Uh, and we don't have any other images of this person, so we can't compare this study to the real Tsitsianos image. But you can see the transformation, how from a slightly fattish um, man, the groom eventually becomes a slightly dry and thin, a uh, man with an important order on his chest who would normally be awarded to uh, high-ranking military people or officials. It would have been very romantic if a young lady fell in love with an old and noble general. But what Pukerev has really depicted is, is that this is not a military man, not because he is wearing tails, but because the order he has on his chest would only be awarded to civilians. This order does not have any military insignia. If this order was given to a military person, it would have looked different. Um, what's also important is that the old groom is very well dressed, uh, wearing very fashionable, the last uh, fashion, fashionable items uh, and garments, his uh, scarf, his tie, his tails. I have also underlined or tried to uh, draw your attention to the other two 
uh, images. This old lady, which is peeping behind the shoulder of the groom, uh, it used to be thought that this was the painter's old aunt. But if you look at their headdresses, both ladies are wearing orange blossoms wreathed, and only a bride had the right to wear an orange blossom decoration on her hair. So you can see, uh, you, can, you can perhaps see a certain um, mysterious hints in this uh, painting. Possibly these are the two previous deceased wives of this old general and then the, the, the painting receives even a certain mysterious uh, phantasmagoric meaning. Please, um, I would like to draw your attention to another character in the painting who played an important role in, uh, in the story of the painting of another man and friend of the painter, Gribensky, who was a frame master. He was an excellent frame master and you will see that this painting is very lavishly framed, which is a rare case. And it's also rare when we acquire a painting with its original frame. This frame was uh, uh, made specifically for, Kiprin, uh, for Pukherev's painting. It, uh, it bears a symbolic meaning and reflects the story on the canvas. You can see that the frame is a knot of two plants and both plants have a certain meaning. One is the orange blossoms, the symbol of purity, happiness. Unfortunately, they are being suffocated by ivy. Ivy, which is dry and old, but is very resilient and is stifling, is, is suffocating the flowers of orange blossom. And that reflects, in a sense, what is happening in the painting. And in order to thank his friend, friend for executing such a marvelous frame, Pukirev painted his face in the picture. Who is the bride? Many people have asked this question. Who is this tearful young girl who is trying to collect all her courage not to betray her terror, her sadness? She always touches the hearts of people. Everybody sympathizes with you. In 1902, a remarkable event has happened, which has practically overturned the history of this painting. The Tractic of Gallery has acquired a drawing which bears the following inscription. It is a portrait. 44 years ago, says the inscription, the artist Pukerev painted his bride in the painting Unequal Marriage from this old lady, Nadezhda Varintsova. Miss Varintsova lives in an old house. So, we were very intrigued. Who is this lady? Was indeed this lady a young model of the bride? Perhaps indeed this old lady 44 years ago was an image, was an inspiration for this young and unfortunate bride. Perhaps her life tur didn't turn out as happy as she hoped. But it is obvious that it is very difficult to disclose all the secrets of these paintings, to reveal every single one. You can see the features of this aged lady, and they still bear resemblance to the young lady's name, who perhaps was a model or an inspiration for Pukerev. And we cannot help admiring and marveling at all the twists and turns in life which reveal such wonderful secrets and continue us being so invested and involved in this painting. This painting can never age. It will always incite sympathy. It will always 
raise questions, it will always make us admire the works of art of such wonderful painters from the Tretyakov Gallery collection, a museum I love so dearly and I will dedicate the rest of my life to serving it. Thank you. In conclusion, I would like to thank our sponsor, Natalia, who is the who represents this wonderful edition and to thank all the organizers who were helping me with preparing this lecture. Perhaps their work was not very visible, but it, they all made a very valuable contribution for all us people who love art.